Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patron, Mads B. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. First up today, a quick note on the update to the Inflation Reduction Act, how they're postponing some of the requirements to March of next year. A lot of people online are just saying now all EVs are going to qualify for this incentive for the first quarter of 2023, and that is not true. The delay here is really only for the material sourcing and the component requirements everything else is still going to apply at the beginning of the new year. Which means the income limits, $300,000 cap for married filing jointly, $150,000 for everybody else, $225K for head of household. The price caps for the cost of these vehicles will apply, $55,000 for cars and $80,000 for vans, trucks, and SUVs. And the requirement to actually manufacture these vehicles in North America will also still apply right away. This delay could benefit Tesla this way. So the Model 3 rear wheel drive, which does qualify because it's less than $55,000, will get the full $7,500 credit. However, once these rules kick in those sourcing requirements, if the battery pack doesn't meet them, then this may only qualify for half or $3,750. The Model 3 performance is of course disqualified because of the price cap and I am hoping that sometime next year Tesla brings back a Model 3 long range under that $55,000 cap. That part is just my hope. In preparation for these changes, Tesla is wisely now directing new buyers. When you click this buy now button, it actually takes you to the current inventory and now they have this custom order option if you want to configure one. And for the Model Y, treating it like an SUV, it is under that $80,000 cap, so both variants should qualify for the full credit right away on January 1st. But again, this will only apply to income earners under the threshold. Model S and Model X both, of course, disqualified because they're over $80,000. And don't forget, for the rest of December, you can still get a $3,750 credit and 10,000 free miles of supercharging if you take delivery this month. And to encourage that, Tesla also has this option on the configurator that will also take you to inventory vehicles where you can take delivery sooner. Drive Tesla Canada shared a picture from Whole Mars showing us that at the Peterson Museum, they have now removed Steel Dynamics as being the steel supplier for the Cybertruck. Here's the proof. At one point, it said, Cybertruck body will utilize steel produced by Steel Dynamics. And here's the update, Steel Dynamics is now nowhere to be found. So unless somebody is doing some Photoshop work here, this is worth passing along. What it means exactly, I'm not sure, but on my recent live stream on Patreon, we talked about this briefly, so wanted to give that update. We got the weekly insurance registration data for Tesla out of Shanghai, and look at BYD. 50.4 thousand for the week, doing a 5X on Tesla. So all of our Tesla fandom aside, we have to give a hat tip to BYD and what they're doing in this market. So yeah, it would be great for Tesla to have a more affordable vehicle in this market right now, but they don't and they're not going to anytime soon. So here's the chart from Matias plotting the most recent data. And for what it's worth, Troy was expecting around 13,000 for the week, which would have been in line with what we saw the week prior. Again, this is domestic sales in China only, and we know everything that's going on right now, so we've been expecting this slowdown. This should come as no surprise. Roland on Twitter has also been doing some really good work, so I wanted to highlight him here as he presented this data in a different way. The green-blue portion of the bar is Model Y, orange Model 3, and this gray part is the insurance registration data so far for this quarter. So this is comparing quarters for Tesla, again, just domestic deliveries in Shanghai. Currently for quarter four, we sit at 108,000 with about two weeks left. So if we get another 10,000 per week, that's another 20,000. That would take us to 128,000 a new record quarter for domestic deliveries in the midst of a recession and very tough economic conditions in China. That's a win in my book. But with that said, I need everybody out there to be prepared for a slowdown, especially into Q1 in Shanghai, as some of these incentives go away and the cyclical nature of car buying into quarter one also slows down. And before we move on, I would just add, there's still a pretty big question mark about what the export number will be for Giga Shanghai for December. So that's one we have to wait for. And yes, it might be effectively zero, but as I said, there's at least a non-zero chance that it's not zero. Brian Zach 419 on Reddit shared this image that tells us there's this alert saying live camera in use 
if you're using the mobile app to view the live sentry mode while in dog mode. And yes, according to the comments, if you stop viewing the live stream from your mobile app, then this notification will go away. I'm also being told the live sentry mode for dog mode will still work even if there are other humans in the car. This comment was great, had to share it. Rousby said, maybe my dog will behave when he sees that. Wishful thinking. Earlier this year, I tweeted about the three non-Tesla people I've learned the most from this year. One of them was Andrew Huberman. If you care at all about wellness and longevity, I would highly encourage you to check him out. He also happens to join the crew of Lex Friedman, the Institute of Human Anatomy, and Stephen Mark Ryan in the gang that takes and recommends Athletic Greens. AG1 is the sponsor of this video, but I've been taking Athletic Greens now for over a year. It's simple, I wanted something quick and easy to provide a baseline of key nutrients every day, no matter how off track my diet gets in busy seasons of life. I chose AG1 in part because it's certified by NSF, meaning I can actually trust what's on the label is actually what I'm putting into my body. Do not take this for granted in 2022. AG1 has 75 different probiotics, minerals, and vitamins in every serving. I also like to drop in some of their vitamin D3 K2. If you live in a snowy, cloudy climate like myself, vitamin D is crucial. And what's cool is with every order, AG1 donates to organizations providing nutritious meals to children in need. AG1 is offering electrified viewers a one-year supply of vitamin D3 K2 and five travel packs for free with every new purchase. The link is in the description below. This morning on Twitter, I said using a $7.50 earnings per share figure for Tesla for 2023, for context, Gary Black is at $7.20, the Tesla forward PE ratio has dipped below 20. It's sitting around 19 now, the lowest it's been since early 2020. Also for context, it's been trading over 100 times for most of 2020 and 2021. If you liked it then, you should really like it now. But as always, this is never financial advice. I showed you that to make a point here from this Bloomberg article. They're saying comparing Tesla, which they have at a 36 times forward earnings, this is from a few days ago, compared to the mid to high single digit multiples for GM, Ford, Honda, and Toyota being in the high teens when it comes to a multiple. So now Tesla is even closer to approaching these other automakers. But if you use that as your justification for Tesla being overvalued, you're so far lost from the story of what's really going on, if you really think that Tesla deserves the same valuation multiple as these other automakers, then honestly, I'm not sure what to tell you. I'd say go back to Electrified Video 1 and watch all of them, and hopefully you'll have a different perspective. So with Toyota's forward multiple being in the high teens and these other companies being mid to high single digits, Tesla is now very close to those valuations sitting around 19 times forward earnings. And while we're here, it's important to mention for the last few months, people have been calling for Tesla stock to the 140s and there's been a reason for it. And I even said in the past, I won't be surprised if it happens. Here we are, it literally hit that level today. So here it is, here's that level of support people were talking about weeks ago, 140, why was that? You can see all of this consolidation of trading activity that lasted for about 91 days back in 2020. From this weekly perspective, the next real level of support isn't until around the $97 or $100 mark. I know many people dislike technical analysis. All it really is is showing us the price action at different price points. Obviously, there's a lot of psychological behavior going on with the markets, and people behave differently at different price levels at different times. So all TA is, is looking at how people behaved with a certain stock in the past. And I get a little charged up with this stuff because it's really helped me be a better long-term investor. And I say that because of this. If you look at Tesla stock price action over the last, what, we'll call it a year. I know for a fact, after this dip, people started FOMOing back into Tesla saying, oh, it can't go any lower than this. They start feeling good, feeling good, and then we go even lower. What happens? Oh, well, it definitely can't go lower than this. I'm gonna go all in. And these people end up running out of powder because it happened again, and here we are. And I know some of you out there are out of capital to invest. 
And that's fine, I know times are very tough, but when you're in a bear market, when we're in a downtrend with these regular lower lows and lower highs, these levels are a big deal. And this is even more important. For most of 2021 and some of 2022, I was actually working on opening a trading hedge fund with a subscriber of mine. Ultimately, it didn't work out. Some family things came up with my partner. However, for six to nine months, I was all in studying, taking courses. I used to manage over $65 million for other people at Edward Jones. Point being, I've been in this space, I've lived it, I've talked to people, and I understand that whether you like it or not, Wall Street uses technical analysis heavily. And I need you to know whether you like this or not. Most of the trades that are executed on a daily basis are actually done by algorithms, not real people. These algorithms are set to operate and execute at what? different levels. Add to that all of the margin that's now more present in the market, especially with Tesla, that's easy to get for any retail trader. They also have what? Stop losses at different levels. So even if you're not a trader at all and you're just a long-term investor, I just hope this little rant can turn even one person from hating technical analysis to having an open mind to at least giving it a chance to understanding how to use it as a long-term investor. And I think what really turns people off is then they start to think these levels are like gospel and that every single time it's hit, we're gonna see a bounce or it breaks through, whatever. Nothing ever in trading works 100% of the time. It's just to give us guidelines and things to think about. I got a question on Twitter, how do you determine where these levels are? I would just say, find a time frame that suits your investment strategy. I'm a long-term investor, so I'll choose weekly. Then looking at the chart, where do you see levels? Where has the stock traded in the same range for an extended period of time? There's plenty of other tools and indicators I can teach you more and I will in the future, again, on a different platform, stay tuned. But just looking at the candles, I see a lot of trading in this range, right here, right here, right here and where we're currently at in this 140 range, again, where we spent three months. And like I said, the next level of support, which is around $97, we traded there for about a month, which yes, in theory means it's not as strong of a level as this one because we were here for three months. And for beginners, I think it's best to think about these levels as ranges and not set prices. Like if you think Tesla's just gonna trade right at 140 for the next three months, that's not the best way to think about it because as you see, it just hovers around that level. Much more to say on that in the future, but for now, for long-term investors, not financial advice, but this does feel like a gift given the current valuations. Just a quick note on the rumors about potential Model S production at Giga Berlin. I think this is more likely than most people. I'm not saying I think it's going to happen, but considering it's already a high margin vehicle for Tesla, it would be even higher margins if they produced it locally in Berlin for that market where it should sell very well. I'm curious, what do you guys think? Just a quick note on Lucid raising this $1.5 billion. This is not new. They mentioned this after their third quarter earnings back in November. This is just confirmation of that deal closing and also a part of why it's gonna be much harder for Lucid to go bankrupt or go out of business because they're backed by the Saudi Public Wealth Fund, which has very deep pockets. The same thing goes for Live Golf, if you know what I'm talking about. Here we have a very interesting survey done by KPMG, surveying auto industry executives and their sentiment as we head into 2023 for electric vehicles. First, they surveyed 915 executives in October of this year and 252 of them were based in the United States. Of the 900 auto execs that were surveyed, 76% are concerned that inflation and high interest rates will adversely affect their business next year. In the US, that figure was higher at 84%. When it comes to their expectations for EV sales of the overall auto market, previously they were sitting at 20 to 70% by 2030. Now in this survey, those figures are down to 10 to 40% by 2030. For the United States, the median expectation for EV sales was 35% of the new vehicle market by 2030, and that was down from 65% just one year earlier. KPMG's head of global automotive said there's still a sense of optimism long term, and yet most importantly, there's a sense of realism in the near term. I actually loved this line. He said, it's not rainbows and butterflies and euphoria anymore. It's game on. 
What I also found interesting is these executives are now thinking Apple will be one of the leaders in EVs. On the right, we have the results from last year and on the left from this year. So Tesla takes the top spot with the most votes for both years. However, you can see Apple went from near the bottom last year to now being in the fourth spot. The main reasons for these expectations for Apple, their brand, and their working with Foxconn. For me, you're gonna have to give me a little bit more than that to do well building EVs and competing with the best of the best. In a separate study that involves semiconductors, the chips, automotive is seen as the most important sector for driving revenue over the next year. That's a first in the 18 years of this survey. Why is that? Well, of course, EVs are more tech forward and require more of these advanced chips. And a silver lining, 83% of automotive executives who took the poll said they were confident in higher profits over the next five years, which was actually up from 53% in the survey last year. My biggest takeaway from all of this, if all of these executives are less bullish on EV adoption in the near term, what does that mean? They're not willing to take as much risk when it comes to developing new electric vehicles or buying parts for these EVs. Maybe they're looking to cut some corners to try to inflate their profits in the short term again as they try to transition over to EVs. If you read between the lines, it seems like a lot of these automakers may actually swing the pendulum back to prioritizing some of their ICE vehicles where they're actually making money because again, companies like Ford with the Mach-E and the F-150 Lightning are actually losing money as far as we know. And if these execs are less bullish on how many EVs they can sell, well, guess what? They're not going to make as many EVs which yes, could be another headwind for the competition to keep their EV volume suppressed and give Tesla more time to sprint further and further ahead. In the past, I've said I'm not a big fan of surveys. To distinguish, I'm not a big fan of surveys of consumers by brands that may have ulterior motives, but a reputable firm like KPMG interviewing executives on their sentiment about their business is a little bit different, at least in my eyes. When you first see headlines like this one, it's pretty easy to get excited, but this really is just for testing and to start validating some of these cells for different automakers. QuantumScape has begun shipping some of these prototypes to automakers that are still unnamed, but we know VW does invest in QuantumScape and these are nearly full-size prototypes, but they also said commercial production is still at least a few years away. This is good news if you've been watching the channel for a few months. Originally, the post office was going to replace their mail trucks with mostly gas ICE vehicles, which was insane, but they received a lot of pushback. So the latest is they plan to buy 66,000 EVs for its fleet by 2028, which would be about a quarter of the USPS's current fleet size. They'll buy 60,000 vehicles from Oshkosh and then 45,000 of those will be electric. The other 21,000 commercial EVs will come from other suppliers. And a quick favor to ask, a good friend of mine put together a 12 question survey all about EVs. So if you would take literally 30 seconds to go fill it out, it'll be linked in the description below. We would both greatly appreciate it. Don't forget, check out AG1 linked below, get your freebies and also check out Andrew Huberman if you're not familiar. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.